to Chicago, the last great beautiful city left on earth. Thank y'all so much! Watch your step here. Wrigley Building up here on your right, built in the early 1920s, named of course for everybody's favorite chewing gum conglomerate. A wonderful example of a classically ornamental beautiful building. This is built at a time when Chicago architects were focused on beautifying our city, and the best way that they knew how to do that was to take already established notions of beauty from our friends in Europe and drop them into the States. The tower up at the top of the building is modeled after what is called the Hidalga Tower, which stands atop the Seville Cathedral in Spain, one of the largest Gothic churches anywhere in the world. Jumping ahead to something that is decidedly not Spanish Revival, standing at 1,389 feet, including that spire way up at the top there. Remember that for later, that spire is going to come back around. Now, to the surrounding environment or context that the building stands in. Give you some examples. First up, you notice the way the building curves around the edges. There are no hard 90 degree angles on the Trump Tower. Those curves around the edge corner. Now, Black Box, yeah, AMA Plaza is built in 1973 in a style quite literally called Black Box Modern. So let's talk about a real icon in the skyline, shall we? The Marina City Towers, the Corn Cob Towers, as they are sometimes called. This is the Midwest, after all. But these were built in the late 1960s to build these two self-contained residential towers, uh, complete with tons of amenities inside, grocery stores, retail and convenience shops, a bowling alley, swimming pools, an outdoor marina for the tenants' boats, and a movie theater, which eventually became the Chicago House of Blues. Beauty. Goldberg actually said of his contemporary, Mies Bondaro, father of American modernism, this expansive red brick was built in 1914. It's one of the oldest surviving warehouse structures on the Chicago River. Home these days to a couple of great uh, restaurants and the headquarters of the Encyclopedia Britannica. But one thing you'll notice, there are six columns of windows on the right-hand side of the central clock tower, and there are only five columns of windows on the left-hand side. Six, five. Why the asymmetry? Because in 1930, the South Street here had to be widened. You'll notice the three levels of columns to the building. First Chicago School architects were focused on building purely functional towers, not ornamental ones. Uh, and their blueprint was the Greek or the Roman column. In their minds, Greek and Roman columns of limestone you see before you. My third favorite building in the city, this, my friends, is the Merchandise Mart, built in 1930. It is also our first great example of the Art Deco style. Now, Art Deco, as a movement, explodes in the late 1920s. Uh, flanked on either side by stone columns. That's actually meant to naturally draw your eye upwards. We call that streamlined verticality. Up at the top of the building, you'll notice the setbacks meant to reduce the building's perceived bulk. And then along the top and the bottom of the building, you'll notice repeated geometric symbols stamped in a horizontal ribbon meant to give the building a sense of symmetry. Oftentimes, this is from where Chicago springs, as best we can figure. Wolf Point is the section of the, of the city where our first trading outpost was built, where our first bridges were constructed to span the river, where we built our first, our, our first hotel, our first church, and most importantly, three of the earliest bars in the skyline, the Salesforce Tower. San Francisco is not the only one anymore. Can't wait to see this one go up. It is going to be something to see. Are we from the Bay Area? I see. Uh, they actually have a car elevator service in the building because they couldn't really figure out a better way to make a parking garage. So the concave curve of the Riverbed condominiums is matched by the convex curve of River Point, its next door neighbor. A little more contextualism for you. That is on purpose. And both of these buildings have their own dialogue going with that handsome expanse of dark green glass on the opposite side of the Look at that. So, this tightrope walker of a tower is 150 North Riverside, also called the William Blair Building. They own most of the space inside. But it was built in 2017 after was dig down 
120 feet through Chicago's soil and clay until they hit bedrock. Once there, they put up a series of 12 concrete columns called caissons, and these caissons effectively act as the building's spine, transferring the weight of the upper floors down into the lower depths. That is how the building manages to be so skinny at the bottom and so top-heavy further up, because it is a core-supported structure with the vast majority of the weight being pulled underground. That's also what those diagonal bits, cuts in the building are for, to help distribute the weight a little more evenly. Again, it took 80 years for any to figure out how they could build on this plot of land before this tower was finished. So, this is one of the most technologically beautiful buildings we have on this river of ours. We'll come back to one for you a little later. There's one more asked to have the Bank of America Tower. Built just this last year, uh, one of our latest additions to the skyline. The Bank of America is a cousin to 150 in the hallmarks are all present. The dark windows, the streamlined verticality, the pot belly sign to the right of the tower there. Uh, just forgot about that for a second. But uh, the setbacks at the top, great sense of symmetry about the entire space. This is actually a portion of the tour where we get a clear architectural timeline of Chicago's evolution over the last hundred years, the American and European styles. There's a lot of optimism and opulence about these buildings. They come at a time of wealth in the United States, the Roaring Twenties. Of course, the party comes to a screech in Gateway Center number one here, and Gateway Center number two next door, built in 1965 and 67. These are the clearest examples that I can show y'all of Mies van der Rohe's black box modernist aesthetic. You see, Mies van der Rohe, about these babies, they are a sim they serve a simple function. It's where you go to do your job and then go home and cry. So uh, contextualism also tries to bring your awareness to the space that it stands in. The green glass reflects the color of the Chicago River. That is its natural color, by the way. Uh, and the reflective glass itself is meant to bring your awareness to the full 360-degree area that the building stands in. Simple, but effective. Contextualism, when it starts off in the 80s, is very much seen as architecture of a place, by a place, and for a place. Now, the post office was constructed in 1921. It was abandoned in 19... or sorry, uh, it was expanded in 1932 to become the world's largest post office. And for good reason. At the time, Chicago was the mail order catalog capital of the country. Thank you, Sears Roebuck and Company. Thank you, Montgomery Ward. And thank you, Marshall Field. Chicago was a top city in terms of mileage of train tracks inside and outside of the city. On top of that, our geographical location made us sort of a gateway city between the industrialized east and the agricultural west. And then on top of all of that, in 1848, we opened up the Illinois-Michigan Canal at the very southern tip of the Chicago River, which effectively linked the Mississippi River watershed with the Chicago River and the Great Lakes, turning this area into a prime trade port, certainly one of the best in the country. So with all this economic activity going on, it makes sense that we have people surging into the city by the tens of thousands. It also starts to make a little more sense, not a lot, just a little, why the city planners of the day decided in an effort to contain all of these people, the best possible course of action would be to build everything in Chicago out of the cheapest and the most readily available resource, which was, of course, wood. And when I say that, I don't just mean we built our office towers or our houses out of wood. That's kid stuff. We built our streets and our sidewalks out of wood. Because if you're going to be extra, you might as well go all the way. Seventy-one. We were going through a four-month drought at the time, so that was not helpful. And then just the cherry on top of the architectural, architectural, the cherry on top of the disaster Sunday, the fire broke out in a barn belonging to Mrs. Catherine O'Leary, which we are only a few blocks east of right now. Just to give you an idea of where the fire started, there's a radio tower just on the other side of that mall and parking lot there. Uh, that is where Mrs. O'Leary's barn once stood. These days, it is home to the Chicago Fire Academy, because irony is not dead in Chicago. So, with this in mind, the fire went to the wrong location. So that by the time they actually arrived on the scene of the fire, it had burned out of their control. We had a lot of high wind out of the southwest that evening that pushed the fire deep into the heart of downtown Chicago, where the fire basically feasted on our wooden city. So much so that it took two and a half days for the fire to burn itself out. And at the end of that time, we were left with a patch of land uh, three and a half miles long and one mile wide 
that was completely devastated. Over 17,000 buildings were destroyed, and a third of Chicago's population was left homeless. Over 100,000 people. Still one of the, it is still the largest urban fire disaster in American history. Has not been beaten. Thank you so much. Now, in the wake of this horrible tragedy, uh, the city decides that a couple of big things need to shift. Number one, uh, no more wood. Thank you. Uh, the fire, yeah, I see you all nodding. Yes, easy, easy one. Thank you. Uh, the city actually outlawed the use of building with wood, opting instead for brick and stone, more fireproof materials, please. Thank you. The second big thing the city instituted was a zoning ordinance. So, you know how the downtown area is very spread out? It's a grid pattern, pretty easy to navigate. That was the city's decision in the wake of the Great Chicago Fire to spread the buildings out a bit more so that whole blocks would not go up in smoke were this to ever happen again. This also led to the creation of alleyways, which as it turns out, is probably the best place ever to put your trash, take notes of other cities. And then finally, most significantly, uh, the burnt out area of the city was repurposed and turned into a pure commercial district. Before the fire, this area had been this mix of barns and livestock pens and uh, taverns and office buildings and the city just, and the city said you know what let's get rid of all of that except for the office buildings this whole area is dedicated exclusively to commerce now and that I believe is what attracted so many architects and engineers to the city at the time because they realized if they're rebuilding the commercial district then there is money to be made it's during this time in the wake of the fire that the first Chicago School of Architecture springs up, begins rebuilding the city in their own image. Uh, the best thing, the most significant thing that the first Chicago School of Architecture gave us was in 1884 when they built the world's first steel frame skyscraper. It was called the Home Insurance Building, built in 1884 for the Home Insurance Company. It was only about 10 stories tall. It really was not terribly much to look at, but the real innovation was not the height of the building or even the design of it. The innovation was the use of a steel skeleton to support the weight of the building. Before this, most skyscrapers, had been all skyscrapers really, had been built using uh, load-bearing walls of brick and stone to keep the building upright. Stable, ornate, sure, but very heavy. At a certain point, at a certain height, say eight or nine stories, there's a danger of these towers sinking into Chicago's swampy soil, because in case you didn't know, Chicago is actually a swamp. That's why it gets horribly humid here in the summers. Now, with a steel frame skyscraper, you don't have that issue. It's lighter, and it's actually cheaper uh, to build than using a load-bearing structure. Now, Unfortunately, the home insurance building no longer exists, but it did pave the way for the architecture that we know and love today. So let's talk about what's right in front of us, shall we? First up, about 45 degrees off the bow with the aluminum statue up at the top there. That is the Chicago Board of Trade, our last great Art Deco structure built in the uh, city of Chicago. Uh, all the hallmarks of Art Deco are present. You'll get another good look at it on the other side of the bridge. The dark windows, the streamlined verticality, the setbacks running up the building, the aluminum statue up at the top is actually supposed to be the Roman goddess Ceres. She's the goddess of agriculture in the Roman pantheon, in a nod to the Board of Trade's early days as a commodities exchange. Nice and on the nose for you. Now, the pink granite tower here directly in front of us, that is 311 South Wacker, uh, commonly called the Crown Building because in just about an hour's time, that crown is going to light up using a combination of LED and energy efficient bulbs, and it is really quite something to see. In the, in the 90s, when the tower was constructed, they lit it using over 1,800 fluorescent light bulbs, which, first of all, environment, come on, y'all. Uh, but also, it was very bright, uh, terribly bright. It was so bright, it was disrupting the migration patterns of birds. They mistook the crown for the moon. They got horribly turned around. It got real ugly in a hurry, and the city decided we don't ever want that to happen again. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, these days, during the peak migration season, they dim the lights in the crowd so as not to disrupt the flow of nature. And now, my friends, we get a good slow reveal for the Grand Valley of them all. The tallest tower in Chicago, by the Sears Willis Tower, my friends. Built in 1974. At the time, the tallest tower anywhere in the world. These days, it's just barely inside the top 20 of global super tall structures, but it's doing fine. Uh, still the third tallest building in the country, behind the One World Trade Center in New York, and the brand new Central Park Tower, also in New York. It just opened at the start of the summer. The Willis 
still stands at a pretty good 1,451 feet. That, however, does not include the antennas way up at the top there. Remember that thing I said about Trent Tower Spire coming back around? Here we are. Now, the way that you officially measure a tall building, for those of you who have always wanted to know, you go from the lowest open air public entrance and you measure to the top of the building structure. And those antennas are not part of the building structure, not technically. They are added after the roof was finished, therefore they don't count towards its height. Just like wearing a hat does not make you taller. Whereas, something like the One World Trade Center and the Trump Tower here in Chicago have what's called spires. And spires are built alongside the rest of the building. They are structurally integral to it, so they do count towards the building's height. You can remove the antennas from the top of the Willis. You cannot remove a spire from the One World Trade Center. Now, very briefly, sidebar here. Uh, this map was added to 300 South Wacker in 2014. It's not an original part of the building itself. There's a map of the Chicago River, that red dot in the middle there, you are here. In a wonderful example of how public art can take a formerly nondescript black box tower and put it both literally and figuratively on the map. You're welcome. Now, coming back to the Willis Tower, uh, we'll get another good look at the building as we pass by the other, uh, as we pass by this building here on our right. The Willis, looks like nine different columns all clustered around each other. That is the brute force form of engineering on display. The Willis Tower uses a system called bundled tubes engineering, or bundled columns. The idea was invented by the tower's architect, Bruce Graham, and the chief engineer, Basler Khan. The idea is, rather than make a tall tower by stacking columns on top of one another, you cluster columns around each other bracing and supporting the other columns, and most importantly, you brace the two central columns to make the full journey from ground to rooftop. Only two columns on the Willis make that full 1,451 foot journey. The rest of them fall away like parts of a rocket ship as it climbs into space. But basically, those seven other columns disrupt the wind force at various points along the building, and they keep the tower from swaying any more than six to eight inches in any direction. Uh, in a doomsday scenario, 200 mile per hour winds would push the building about a foot and a half in each direction, which is a horrifying thought. So let's move on from that. The tower has been climbed twice in its long and colorful history. First, by an American in 1981. His name is Dan Goodwin. He's a, Chicago, he's a retired Chicago firefighter now. Climbed the Willis Tower using suction cups while wearing a Spider-Man costume. So props to that guy. And then a second time in 1999, the tower was climbed by a Frenchman named Alain Robert, who climbed the building in two hours' time using only his bare hands and a bag of chalk, which is the most bonker thing I have ever heard. Alain Robert, as it turns out, has kind of made a name for himself with climbing these super tall global structures. Most notably, in 2011, he climbed the Burj Khalifa in Dubai, all 2,717 feet of it. That is the height if we stacked Trump Tower on top of the Willis Tower. That is about the height of the Burj Khalifa. So, yeah, they are not messing around in Dubai. <laughs> Uh, to kind of drive the point home about the antennas on, oh, actually, you know what? Yeah, let's talk about this bear. This building's much more lively than it usually is. This, my friends, is CME Group, old home for the Chicago Mercantile Exchange before they fused with the Board of Trade to make CME Group, currently the world's largest derivatives and options exchange. They handle one quadrillion dollars annually. Is that a real number? I don't think so, but that's what it says on their website, so that's what we roll with. Uh, it is actually pretty incredible. The central portion there is where the trading floor is, and it's supported by the two towers on either side of it. There are no internal columns in the middle of the building on that trading floor. Now. This building is one of our few ornamental beauties on this stretch of the river. This is the old Civic Opera Theater, built in 1929. Uh, built to house the Chicago Civic Opera. Uh, and it dated for about two weeks, and then the stock market crashed. Uh, yeah, kind of a shame. But the Lyric Opera has owned the building outright since the 1990s, so it's a happy ending for the performing arts, all told. Uh, one thing I want you all to notice, the Civic Opera was built the exact same year as Riverside Plaza here, 1929. So you can start to kind of see this shift from a slightly more decorative European style 
to a slightly less ornate but very clean and symmetrical uh, fusion style in Art Deco. I think this idea of symmetry, by the way, is what the modernists take from Art Deco and run with to the point that we get these simple black boxes and white boxes and brown boxes. Modernism, by the way, is supplanted by postmodernism historically, which we don't get a lot of on this tour. Uh, if any of you haven't been to Millennium Park yet, you get to see, and you've seen the Pritzker Pavilion, that gorgeous expanse of curved steel. That's a great example of a uh, postmodernist bit of art designed by Frank Gehry, himself a prominent postmodernist. But the Boeing Tower here has a little bit of postmodernist flair to it as well. It was built in 1990 to house the headquarters of Morton Salt, everybody's favorite table garnish. Boeing moved in in 2001, made this their international HQ, but there is a little remnant of Morton Salt left. If you look up to the top of that tower there, you see those six circles cut to the steel grating? It is said that the architect, Ralph Johnson, added those to the top of the building in reference to its now former tenant, Morton Salt, to make the building look like a salt shaker. How they deal with the wind force. I mentioned the bundled tubes system the Willis Tower employs, 150 has their own ingenious, ingenious method. They use a system called inertial slosh dampeners, okay? Here's harmonic frequency so that when wind strikes the side of the building, the water in the tanks is engineered to slosh back against that wind force and thus bring the building back to center more quickly. Essentially, the water acts like a shock absorber dampening the force of the wind so that the building doesn't sway too far before coming back to equilibrium. It is a brilliant bit of 21st century engineering. Again, 150 North Riverside there is probably the most technologically beautiful building that we have on this tour, if not in this city. Now, we're back in River Point, sorry, River Point, we're back in Wolf Point here. On our right, we have the Naveen Building, once again, built in 1983. One of the earliest examples of contextual architecture in this part of the city, and again, where Ferris Bueller's dad once worked. But I want to talk about the contextualism of the building, because its architect, Ralph, not Ralph, uh, its architect, William Peterson, called it a collage of contextual references. So we're going to dive right into that. First up, we have the wide, convex facade mimicking the curve in the Chicago River on the right-hand side of the boat there. You'll notice that the glass alternates color by row. It goes green-blue, green-blue, green-blue. The green is for the color of the river, the blue the color of the sky. On a basic level, that reflective glass acts as a mirror for all the gorgeous architecture in this region, basically saying to it, you look great today. You got this. Yeah, no problem. And then finally, the last piece of the contextual puzzle. On the ground floor there, you see at the main entrance and at the corners of the building, there are those octagonal columns. Those are direct references to the octagonal-shaped corners of the Merchant Guys Park directly across the river. So this might seem like architectural overkill, or like I'm just making stuff up at this point, but that is kind of what contextualism is all about. It is meant to be so subtle as to be imperceptible, and it's meant to bring everything around the building up. See that steel box right at eye level, just above the river walk there? That box is filled with about 34 projectors, and at 7.30 and 8 o'clock, those projectors are going to broadcast this massive moving art show all across the facade of the now, I want to talk about the river walk here. Uh, it's Chicago's second best idea, in my opinion. We'll get to the best one later. The river walk was only finished in 2016, so it's still pretty new for all of us. Uh, it's about a mile and a half stretch that includes uh, fish hotels meant to increase the biodiversity of the Chicago River, uh, wine bars, beer gardens, cafes, urban kayak rentals. Great bit, great place for people watching as well. So the Riverwalk, I think, represents this capstone to the city of Chicago's campaign to revitalize this body of water of ours. It's only really in the last 40 to 50 years that we have started to treat this body of water with the respect that it actually deserves. And the Riverwalk, I think, is a natural extension of that. See, in the 1800s, and really through much of the 1900s, the city of Chicago used this river as our dumping ground, our sewage canal. It got pretty ugly in the 1800s. The river used to flow out to Lake Michigan, where where we once did, and still do, get our drinking water from. But back in the 1800s, we didn't exactly have a good filtration process set up. See, we had a few pumping stations a few miles offshore that would pump lake water into our drinking supplies, and it did not take much for the sewage river water to make its way out to the pumping stations. Fast forward past a couple of cholera epidemics, and the city decided that something needed to change. Between 1890 and 1900, 
the U.S. Army Corps of Civil Engineers uh, helped the city of Chicago push the flow of the river back against itself, and they helped us dig out a separate canal on the very southern tip of the river so that the river now flows southwest out of the city into the Mississippi River watershed instead of out into Lake Michigan. It is still one of the largest civil engineering projects ever conceived and accomplished, and there is talk about potentially re-reversing the flow of the Chicago River. If you are curious as to why, come see me after the tour. I have opinions. But again, these days, trying to take much better care of our body of water, we're actually trying to make it fully suitable for y'all by the year 2030. So mark that in your calendars. Uh, coming back to the architecture here, I want to talk about this bristly, angry little guy that you see on the right-hand side. This is 55 West Wacker, built in 1968, what we in the tourism industry lovingly refer to as the Danny DeVito building. Because it's short, it's angry, it's very out of place. Uh, this is built in a style called brutalism, which, as the name suggests, is all about survival more so than anything. It's more like building a bunker than it is a skyscraper. It often makes use of raw concrete to kind of state its position. In fact, the name brutalism comes from a French phrase, béton brut, which quite literally translates to raw concrete. So in case you have any doubt in your mind what their whole thing is, uh, but this most functional of buildings, I believe, is offset by this most ornate of buildings just ahead of us here. Uh, squeezed into the background, the forest green tower with the golden clock tower looking idle at the top of it. That, my friends, is the Carbide and Carbon Building, built in 1929 during the height of Prohibition, that wonderful time in American history when the sale, purchase, and consumption of alcohol was illegal. What a time to be alive that must have been, eh? But if there is one thing that Chicago is known for, it's for not doing prohibition, right? I mean, that's where Al Capone comes from, the untouchables, the Elliot Ness story. So in keeping with this general idea of who cares about prohibition, it is said that the architects of the Carbide and Carbon Building added that bronze and 24 karat gold trim rooftop to resemble the foil wrapped around a champagne cork. It does not hurt the green terracotta on the outside of the building makes it look like a champagne bottle either. Basically, in a telling off to the powers that be saying, yeah, yeah, we know we're not allowed to enjoy this, but we're just gonna, sorry. And yes, that is real 24 karat gold lining that rooftop. It is one five thousandth of an inch thick. Which I am told is twice as thin as Saran Wrap. Who knew, guys and gals and gender non-binary pals? Truly, who knew? All right, now what I am, what I hope I'm impressing upon you all is this sense of evolution in Chicago's architecture, and also the sense of beauty and how it has evolved uh, throughout over the years. Uh, so I want to give you one last little timeline to demonstrate this uh, evolution. Coming around the corner of the Wrigley Building here. We're starting off in the 1920s again. You'll see a tower with a large French Gothic crown at the top, just starting to get lit up. It's very pretty at night. That is the Chicago Tribune Tower, built in 1926, to house the offices of our largest newspaper, the Chicago Tribune, uh, at least until 2018, when they moved out. It's now being turned into condominiums, just the way life goes, I guess. But the design for the building came up asking somebody to design him, and I quote, the world's most beautiful office tower. The winners of the contest were a pair of New Yorkers, Raymond Hood and John Mead Howells, who also designed 30 Rock in New York City. And for the Tribune Tower, they built this soaring fusion of American vertical spirit and French Gothic ornament. That crown at the top, with its flying buttresses, is actually modeled after what is called the Butter Tower, which is the cathedral in Normandy, France. So again, Early, early uh, 20th century, you have these European revivalist styles, a French Gothic building next door to a Spanish Gothic building. Uh, you have, uh, which is supplanted by an Art Deco fusion, 333 North Michigan here on our media right, kind of sets the tone for a classical Art Deco structure. Art Deco supplanted by modernism. It's black boxes, and it's brown boxes, and it's white boxes. We don't get any postmodernism section of the tour, unfortunately, but contextualism springs up in the 80s, right around the time postmodernism starts to decline, and the nice thing about contextualism is it can kind of sneak into any architectural style that it wants. Um, so, I'll give you an example of that. 
To our left here, the NBC Tower, built in 1989 uh, in a style called Echo Deco. What do you think they're doing there? Uh, has a little bit of contextualism sewn into it as well. All the hallmarks of Art Deco are there, the dark windows, the streamlined verticality, but if you look at that second set back there, you see those L shapes jutting out from the building? Those are the NBC Towers versions of flying buttresses, mimicking, excuse me, mimicking the flying buttresses on top of the Tribune Towers crown. It's down the block neighbor, and it's sister building in news organizations. So again, contextualism can sneak into any architectural style that it wants. It's a chameleon. And the next logical step in contextualism is to get out of your immediate area and into your larger environment. So take a look to your right here. Between the white box and the brown box tower, you have the building with all the different balconies on it. That is the Aqua Tower, built in 2010 by my favorite architect working today. Her name is Jeannie Gang, G-A-N-G. She is remarkable. Uh, she is a Midwesterner. Grew up 70 miles west of Chicago in Belvedere, Illinois, before going to University of Illinois for undergrad, and then Harvard for her master's in architecture. And she often works the style called geological textualism, as the name suggests. It's all about bringing your awareness to your larger natural world. So those balconies, in keeping with that idea, those balconies on the Aqua Tower are built to uh, mimic eroded or striped limestone outcroppings, which are commonly seen along the coasts of the Great Lakes. Jeannie Gang is paying tribute to her roots with that building. Those balconies, by the way, also create a sort of topographical map. Uh, you can see how they create hills, they make valleys, they even make bodies of water by their absence in the building. We write a doctoral thesis about any one of Jeannie Gang's towers, but this next one here, this next one is for Sistine Chapel. We've come to it at last, my friends, my favorite tower in the city of Chicago. It goes Merchandise Mart number three, 150 North Riverside number two, and at number one, the St. Regis Chicago, the third tallest building in the city, standing just under 1,200 feet. It is, however, the tallest building in the world, designed by a female architect, Jeannie Gang, once again, with the win. Uh, this building, the first thing you'll really notice about it is the way that it undulates, it dances, if you will, the curve, uh, the way it curves all throughout the building. Uh, the building block for the St. Regis is a shape called a frustum. It's basically just a column or a pyramid with the top shaved off. Uh, frustum, by the way, is a shape commonly seen in crystal and sapphire formations. That was Jeannie Gang's inspiration for the design of the building. So, the, again, that geological contextualism. Uh, so the engineers of the towers built these 12-story high concrete frustums, and they stacked them right side up to upside down. That creates a sort of hourglass shape, which they then just replicated all the way to the top of each of those towers. That is how the building manages to, uh, manages to achieve that swaying effect, that undulation, because the core is essentially... Uh, a column of concrete hourglasses. I love getting to end our tour with this building because it really does stand at the crossroads of functional, ornamental, and technological beauty. And to drive that point a little bit more, if you look up to that top of that third tower there, you notice a couple of floors are missing right in the center there. That is what is called a blow-through floor, and that is the third tower deals with the wind sway. The idea is floors are empty, except for the elevator shaft, so the wind is allowed to blow through them unimpeded, reducing the amount of wind force on the rest of the tower. It is a simple, functional, and elegant solution to fighting the wind force in Chicago. Fighting is actually another right word. The Willis Tower uses bundled columns to fight the wind. The St. Regis uses open doors, essentially, to move with the wind. So I think it's a wonderful indicator of where we are moving in terms of architectural technology. Uh, in a minute here, we're going to pass under, under DuSable Lakeshore Drive, and we're going to turn it around and get a wonderful view of the skyline. First up, let's talk about that lone black tower there, the one that looks like a flask, standing just on the other side of Lakeshore Drive. That is the only private structure on the east side of DuSable Lakeshore Drive, and it's likely to forever remain that way. You see, in the early 20th century, the city of Chicago had their best idea, and they decreed that the entirety of Chicago's lakefront, all 29 miles, would remain open and free for our use. It's public land only. Nothing private, nothing industrial, and nothing commercial, with the exception of Lake Point Tower there. Um, 
because in the 1960s, a couple of uh, developers found a loophole in that law, and they got that building thrown up before anybody could stop them. I don't mind it, personally. I think of it as the explanation mark on the city of Chicago. It's a curvilinear modernist design, first drawn up by our good friend Mies von der Rohe in the 1930s. He did not have a hand in getting this building off the ground, though. A couple of his students did that for him. And a few famous Chicagoans have lived there over the years, including Scotty Pippen of the Chicago Bulls, Wayne Sandberg and Sammy Sosa of the Chicago Cubs, and Kurt Russell and Goldie Hawn of Hollywood fame. Some people say that's where Oprah lived. It's not where Oprah lived. Oprah lived further into the city on a two-story penthouse on top of Water Tower Place, an eight-story mall. That's how Oprah does it.